Hey there, Math 2403. Welcome back to Unit 1, video number 4. I think this is 4 of 5. Today we'll be talking about measures of positions, uh, z-scores, percentiles, and quartiles. Then we'll use those quartiles to create a box and whisker plot. And we'll even discuss uh, the topic of outliers. The past few units, we were talking about measures of the middle, measures of spread, and we were discussing the shape of data. Now we're going to add in a few more, you know, additional me measures and another plot. So it should be pretty good. We'll dive right in. All right. Measures of position. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is the z-score. We're going to use z-scores throughout the entire course. Uh, they're used all over in probability. Uh, we'll also use them again for that topic of outliers, you know, determining whether a value is unusual or not. Uh, z-scores are, are pretty easy to calculate. They're basically the number of standard deviations that a score is away from its mean. So basically, if you pick an individual value in your data set and you want to know how far away it is from the mean in terms of how many standard deviations. Uh, basically, I think it's, it's maybe easier to start by looking at this. Uh, each score in your data set is some number of standard deviations away from the mean. So x is the mean plus some number of standard deviations, where the number of standard deviations could be plus or minus. So z scores can be positive or negative. Positive z scores indicate that you're to the right of the mean or larger than the mean, and negative z-scores mean zero to the left. Uh, taking this formula, I wrote, I wrote the formula using sample values, and then I, I wrote it again using population values. So your z-score formula depends upon whether you're dealing with population data or sample data, but the, the, for, you know, the format is the same. You'll get slightly different results because we, as you may recall, we have a different formula for standard deviation when it's a population versus a sample. If you rearrange these formulas and solve them for Z, you get the ones that are up above. So a Z score is the number of standard deviations a particular score is from its mean, where X is that particular score. How will we use these? Uh, we'll calculate these to determine if a value is unusual. That's our main use uh, initially in the course. Uh, they're nice because they don't have dimensions, so they're great for making comparisons. If you want to compare uh, how far away a particular value is from its mean in one data set to another data set where the units don't match, Z scores are a nice, uh, a nice measure in order to do that difference, because the numerator and the denominator both have the same units. So when you do the division, you lose units. So being dimensionless allows you to do comparisons nicely. And then the third one, which we'll use a lot later, well, not too much later, but a little later in the course, we'll use this to determine probabilities. Z-scores have kind of a neat property in that if you take the mean of all the Z-scores, you end up with zero. And if you take the standard deviation of all the Z-scores, it always ends up being one. So we're going to take advantage of that later in order to find probabilities from normal distributions. We talked about 
the empirical rule and Chebyshev's theorem in, in a previous video, we can restate them using z-scores. Basically, we were already talking about distance away from the mean when we were using the empirical rule. So we said if you're within one standard deviation of the mean, then you encounter 68% of your data when you have a bell curve. That's the empirical rule. And if you're within two standard deviations, meaning you are, I have a z-axis here, if your z-scores range from negative 2 to positive 2, you should encounter most of your values should be in that range, or in fact, 95% of them. And if you go out to three standard deviations, or a z-score of equal to 3, to minus 3, then you encounter 99.7% of your data, again, in a bell curve. You can restate this, again, using Chebyshev's theorem. In Chebyshev's theorem, we had that formula that had a k in it. Well, k was basically a z-score. It's the number of standard deviations away from your mean. Because normal distributions pop up so often, we, we often say that usual values have z-scores between minus 2 and plus 2. In fact, it's 95% if it's a bell curve. In Chebyshev's theorem, I believe that was at least 75% of all data has to be within two standard deviations. So we're going to say that typical scores that wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be surprised by tend to fall in that range. But if you fall outside of that range, then you start to be unusual. So if your z score is larger than 2 or smaller than negative 2, then yeah, those values do occur naturally, but it might be something to investigate. I think that this is a good guideline when you know you have a bell curve. Maybe we need to be a bit more conservative when we don't know the distribution or when we know that the distribution isn't a bell curve. In that case, maybe we should widen it and def define usual values between minus 3 and plus 3. My pen isn't cooperating here. Let me try another one. If you don't know the distribution, like you might not even know if it's not a bell curve. If you just don't know, this is maybe a, a better, a conservative approach. In statistics, a lot of times you'll hear a buzzword called Six Sigma design. And under that, they're referring to the width of this interval. If you go from minus 3 to plus 3 for your z-score, then you are considered, you know, a usual score. Well, that distance is 6 standard deviations or 6 sigma. So any value within 6 sigma you consider to be normal. And anything outside of that is when it sets off alarms and you start to do investigations. So I think this is a, a good criteria. When you know you have a bell curve, go ahead and consider typical values having z scores between minus 2 and plus 2. And when you don't know or you know it's not a bell curve, use this as your criteria. Let's do a little example. Uh, there used to be a, a guy who sold underwear. His name was Michael Jordan. Uh, he's relatively tall. Let's see if he's, you know, very tall. I googled, you know, how tall adult males were in North America 
and the mean was 69 and a half inches with a standard deviation of three. Michael Jordan is 78 inches. So I want to determine if he's unusually tall compared to adult males. You'll notice that I used mu and sigma and they probably didn't measure everyone in North America, but we've gathered so much data about North Americans that we feel confident in, in that these values are, pro to, to one decimal place, these values are probably you know, precise enough to declare them as mu and sigma. So I'm not using sample values there. Uh, one way to determine if he's unusually tall would be to calculate Mike's z-score. Mike's z-score, the formula is his height minus the average height, the distance he is away from normal, and then divide that by sigma to give the number of standard deviations away from the mean. So his height was 78 inches, and the mean height is 69.5 inches and the standard deviation is three inches. You'll see there's inches in the numerator, inches in the denominator. They cancel out so you end up with something that has no units. 2.83 is his z-score. Now our, our heights of adults bell-shaped most likely you know can we assume that if x is the height of an adult male that 69.5 would be in the middle and it's not super spread out because the standard deviation is just three inches now what we basically did was we converted these values to z scores. So rather than trying to figure out where Mike is on this scale, you know, here's roughly 78, say, is that unusual? And I think we can say yes, because he's more than two standard deviations above the mean. We had that, you know, guideline of if you have a, if you're between negative two and two, you are usual. Therefore, you know, Mike is unusually tall. Is Mike a tall basketball player? Uh, let's check. Did a little Googling, found out that the average height of an NBA player is 68 inches with a standard deviation of 3.9 inches. Let's calculate Mike's z-score if that's the case. He's still 78 inches tall, but now the mean is higher. 68 inches is 80 inches. To keep our units all in line, we'll do this calculation, and I can see it's roughly 2 over 4, so it'll be roughly a half. Take out my calculator, uh, negative 0 0.51, no units. He's half a standard deviation below the mean. So it's okay to get negative z-scores. It just means he's shorter than, than the average, but not a lot shorter. So, you know, if you're drawing this out, it looks something like this. If x is the height, 80 inches is the average for NBA player, and he's uh, something like there. He's 78 inches, so he's considered within the normal range. He's not way out in the tails. And to evaluate this, we basically converted these things to z-scores. So 80 inches is no standard deviations away from the mean. 
So the Z score for 80 is zero, and then Mike is just below it at negative 0 0.51. So not unusual. but slightly below normal. So that's a, a, a reasonable application of, of how to use or a way to use Z-scores. One year I gave students a quiz and instead of giving them their grade, I just gave them their Z score. Uh, so students who had a Z score of zero, that meant that they scored the mean. They were zero standard deviations away from the mean. And some students scored 2.8, like Mike, and they were great. They were 2.8 standard deviations above average. But somebody who scored negative one, oh, that's okay. They were below average, but not too far below average. But somebody who scored negative 3.6, they better get to studying because they were way below normal. Uh, it was kind of a fun way to give results on a test. I didn't tell them what the mean was, so they didn't know what their grade was. They just know how they did relative to others. And that is a way to introduce percentiles and quartiles. Uh, these are another measure of position where you're basically sorting your data set and you're dividing the data set up into various parts. Uh, we'll define percentile first. It's the most general case. It's a value which divides data or a population into two parts, the lower K percent of values and the upper 100 minus K percent. We have special percentiles where we break it down into quarters. So oftentimes we'll just use that and have multiples of 25. So first quartile, second quartile, third quartile breaks the data up into the first 25% of your data, your next 25% of your data, the next and the last. So you don't want to be below Q1 on your quiz that means you're in the lowest 25% of your class. And you, but you do want to be Q3 or above because that means you are in the top 75% or it's top 25% of the class or you've beaten 75% of the students who've written the test. The notation is somewhat you know, new. We, we're going to use Q for quartiles and subscripts. First quartile means first 25%, second quartile means second 25%, and third quartile means third 25%. And quartiles are just percentiles. So I could write this, Q3 is the same as P75. It's the 75th percentile. It's the value that separates the bottom 75% from the top 25%. Surprisingly, Excel has both percentile functions and quartile functions, but it really only needs one. If you know, you know that the relationship between them, you technically would only need the percentile uh, function. On the Math 12 Provincial Exam, we had Bill. He scored in the 75th percentile. It doesn't mean he got 75% on the test it means that he beat 75% of the people that wrote the test that day. Oftentimes percentiles are used on standardized testing. Uh, things like the SAT and the GRE and uh, other standardized tests give results in terms of percentile. And I was always curious as to why they did that rather than just give you your grade. And I, I think the, the reason for that is 
they're, they want to be able to compare you from year to year. And each year the test is different. You know, one year the test might be easy, the next year the test might be hard. So if they based your score, if they just gave you your score, well, if you took your test on the easy year, well, you'd have a higher score than you would if you took the test on, say, the next year, which had a harder test. But the idea with percentiles is it allows you to compare from year to year because they're assuming that basically the crop of students who takes the test from year to year is roughly the same. So if you can beat 75% of the people that wrote the test last year on the hard test, you'd probably beat roughly 75% of the people that wrote the easy test. So that's a good usage for percentiles. We also use them to create a new plot, that which is coming up in a, in a bit. How do you calculate these things? Uh, it's, there are different ways of doing it. The first step is to sort your data set. So put your data in order. Uh, we did this when we were finding the median. It turns out that the median, which we determined you know, a couple of lectures ago, is just a percentile. The, the median equals the second quartile, which also is the same as the 50th percentile. So we've already had a little bit of experience with this. I gave a little flow chart on how to, one way to calculate these things by hand. You locate the position where you think the percentile would be in your list. So you, you take your percentage and multiply it by however many values you have in your list. And now when we're calculating percentiles and quartiles, we want to err on the high side. So there's a little bit of magic that we do here with our location function. If our location is a whole number, we're going to bump it up a little bit. So we'll take the, the mean of the value at that position and the next one. If L isn't a whole number, like it, it ends up being a decimal value, we will just round it up. And that'll make sure that we have a conservative value. We're erring on the high side when it comes to percentiles. We'll do some examples and hopefully this will make a little sense. Remember supplier B, <laughs> they had the two by fours and the defects in two by fours. And here's our data set for supplier B. It's in a stem and leaf plot, but if you look at the thing, it's in order. So we have our data set sorted here, right? The, remember this data set would be like 21, 23, 29, 31, 32, etc. You can see it's, it's listed in the same order that it would be if we had actually shown the values. If we want to find, say, the first quartile, that's also the 25th percentile. So I go 25% of the way through the list, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, until I get 25% of the way. To do that, there were 20 values in this list. N was 20. So 25% of 20 items is five. So our first quartile should be approximately five values into the list. So one, two, three, four, and this is the fifth value. But we had a little discussion about this. We want to err on the high side. So rather than just picking the fifth value, we'll take the average of that one and whatever is next. The next value in the list was 36. I could have done that just by looking at the list here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So my first quartile is between these two, so it's somewhere between 32 and 36. So I'll just take their mean. 32 plus 36 divided by two is 34. And the units were defects per, I think it was 50 boards. That's a typo there.
So to interpret that, we'd say that 25% of our boards had less than 34 defects. Doing the example again, we could calculate the median. The median is the second quartile. It's 50% of the way through the list. So 50% of 20 things is 10 items. And then I go to my list and I'm already five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So here's 10, but it was a whole number. So I'm gonna take the mean of 41 and 42. So there's my median for Q2 or P50. So we have many ways of writing the median. Third quartile goes 75% of the way through the list. That puts you at the 15th value. So just count until you hit 15. Uh, I think we end up here at 49. But because it's a whole number, 15 is a whole number, we'll look at that one and the next one. So we're halfway between 49 and 50. Gets us to 49.5. So that's P3, otherwise known as P75. We could do any percentile we want. Say we wanted the 92nd percentile. We're going to go 92% of the way through the list. So 92% of 20 is 18.4. But this time we didn't get a whole number. So we're just going to take this number and round it up and go to that spot in the list. We don't have to do any averaging where we're just going to take that spot. So we'll go to the 19th spot in our list. So count it out. And well, I know there are 20 values, so it's just one before that. So it's the number 69. We know that 92% of our values are smaller than 69 defects per 50 boards. This is a little, this is a kind of a crude way of calculating percentiles. Excel does this a little bit better. Um, Excel would go roughly to the 18th value and then go 0.4 of the way between the 18th and the 19th. So it does a bit of interpolation. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that actually for Excel even, uh, but it's a bit better than what we're doing here. But this, this works. It gives us a rough idea. If you have big data sets, you know, with 10,000 items in it, this is definitely sufficient. Where it breaks down is when you have small data sets, which is, you know, sadly what we'll mostly deal with. Uh, you know, if you have less than 100 values in your list, your 92nd percentile might be the same as your 93rd percentile because you just don't have enough values to pick from. Uh, in Excel, there are functions, uh, percentile, and there are a couple of versions in there. We'll use percentile inc. It wants an array, basically your data, and then which one you want, which is a decimal. It also has a quartile function. We'll use the ink version, meaning inclusive. It's their conservative estimate for quartile. Again, you put it, you put your data in, and then you put in which quartile you want, and it's an integer. First quartile, second quartile, third quartile. I guess we could do uh, a little example of this. Why not? Quickly show you. If we go to supplier B here, I could grab that data. It's really easy to copy and paste from Word. I've noticed that in your labs, it's hard to cut and paste from the from the PDFs, 
uh, if you want to go into Excel. So maybe I'll start posting the Word files rather than the PDF during the tutorials. So here's our data from supplier B. If I wanted to calculate those percentiles, you know, say I wanted Q1. I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Make that cell a little bit wider. I type quartile, and you see you get a few options. We're going to use ink, and it asks for two things, array and quartile. I can type the array. I could type B2 colon B whatever it is, or I can just at this point go and highlight them and then type a comma, and I want the first quartile. And it was 21. I don't know if that matched what we had. And then maybe put some units. And we could do the others too. You know, we could do that. We did that 92nd percentile, you know, P92. I can, uh, let's see if I can show you how to make a subscript. You can highlight the 92 in the formula bar here. And if you right click on that, you can format cells. And there was a subscript option. If you want, you know, really want to be fancy there. And then the function is percentile. And we want ink. We want our array. I'm just going to type it. It's B2 to I don't remember how long the list is, so I'm just going to say B1000. It ignores blanks, so anything, as long as it's blank below it, I'm okay. And then for I want 92%, so you have to put 0.92 in. And you'll see that it's a little different than the answer that we had. But you don't have to sort the values. Excel knows how to do that. If you do want to sort them, you know you can you can highlight these things and go into sort. It's on your home tab, way at the end. And I always do custom sorts because I don't trust these other ones. So custom sort. Uh, see how it has this little thing that says my data has headers. That means title. And I didn't highlight a title. So I'm going to turn that off and just say I'm sorting column B from smallest to largest. And now they're all sorted. If you take a look through the list. We can see that when, when we solved it, the 92nd percentile we said was 69. But it's Excel is saying it's a value between the 18th and 19th value, 64.8. So Excel is actually better than, than the crude method I showed you. But the method I showed you is common in textbooks. But it's not the only one. If you're Googling around on percentile calculators, you might get different results on how to do it by hand. Uh, but you're also welcome to use Excel, even on, you know, the tests. So this is fair game. So yeah, let's jump back into that lecture. We'll continue on a bit. We can make box and whisker plots. There. We can make box and whisker plots. They're just a plot made up of quartiles and the max and min. I'm usually going to just call them box plots. Uh, it's just shorter. But they're a box with some lines coming out of them, which are called the whiskers. 
basically it's a five number summary. It's the minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the max. So pretty, it's, it's an easy plot to make because you're just basically making five dots on a number line and then making it look pretty by drawing a box. So notice there is no y-axis here. There doesn't need to be one. The height of the box has no meaning. I just drew the box this high because it looked good. These plots are fairly useful when you're comparing data sets. I find it as a, a useful way to compare. If I have like five different sets of data that I want to compare, I don't want to make five histograms. It's hard to see the differences between histograms when you have multiple. Uh, but when you have a box and whisker plot, because there's no y-axis, we can just stack them up and have them all basically on the same plot for a nice comparison. The nice thing about these things is you can see where the middle of your data is, which is something we're always interested in. You can see how spread out your data in two ways. How wide is your box and how wide is it from whisker to whisker? So you have, you basically judge these things by those attributes. The median doesn't always land right in the middle of the box. If the median is to the left or the right of the middle, that is a sign that your data may be skewed. For our two suppliers, we had supplier A and supplier B, and I plotted their box and whisker plots. You might recall, like we just did supplier B Supply, supplier B is this upper plot here, and we just calculated Q1 was 34, Q2 was 41.5, and Q3 was 49.5. I just sorted the data in Excel as well. We could have easily found that the maximum value was 72 and the minimum was 21. Basically, I just put a number line and then I plot five points and then connect all the dots making a box in the middle. You can see that it's pretty symmetric data. Uh, you can see that these values aren't as spread out as supplier A, because the box of A is wider than the box of B, and the whole list from the min to the max of B is shorter than the whole list for A. So, kind of a nice plot. My title here is a bit poor. I probably should have explained what this was, you know, the two by fours, etc. But I did label my axis uh, indicating, you know, what these values are. So just from this plot alone, we could probably declare that we like supplier B better than supplier A. You can compare the medians. Like in this case, you wanted smaller values Smaller meant better, so definitely supplier B wins over supplier A. You can go ahead and calculate these quartiles for supplier A. The data is earlier in the lecture, and you can confirm that these are correct using the algorithm described in the notes. Remember, Excel might give slightly different values. Uh, Excel doesn't actually do the best job of creating box and whisker plots. It has one in the most recent version. It's a kind of, it's a new plot to Excel actually. It, it hadn't been there in previous versions. But uh, what I have done in the past for students is I created a box and whisker plot called general box plot. And I'll post that in the learning hub. Uh, and basically it's, uh, a template. Uh, you paste your data in. Oops. <laughs> you paste your data in here on the left side, and it automatically uh, makes your box and whisker plot. So, say I could delete these values here, and I get a new box and whisker plot, or maybe I have some new values 
you know, a thousand, nine ninety, maybe five hundred, sixty. You can see the the box and whisker plot changing in real time. Uh, I probably don't want to put like eight thousand eight eight thousand in with this data set. We won't be able to see much. Uh, but etc. So if you ever have a data set and you want to uh, plot it using a uh, to create a box and whisker plot, you can do so. Just I'll I'll post this for you guys to use. I think it's might be better than the one that is built into Excel. The one that's built into Excel, you can't change much. This one is set up so you can easily, you know, change your title, change your label on your axis. You can also manually adjust the axis. You know, maybe you don't like that I have one decimal place there. So you could right click on it and format the axis. And it's not an axis option, it's a number option. And I can change it to zero decimal places. And then, you know, maybe you prefer it displayed that way. Or maybe you want to change, you know, manually change your minimum and maximum. You know, maybe you want, only want to plot from 400 up to, say, 1,500 to zoom in on it. You know, but it's a little deceptive because you're chopping off the max and min. So I wouldn't rec really recommend doing that. But I just wanted to show you there, are, uh, you know, how you can just mess around with this thing. You just click on the title and you know, type whatever you want for that thing. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so it's so easy. And then I just deleted the whole thing. something whatever your title is so this is kind of handy plus in this spreadsheet i already have all the 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 values for the quartiles built in we'll discuss what these what these weird dotted lines are in, in a second they're on the topic of outliers Okay, there we go. Um, the topic of outliers is, you know, we already talked about these when we we're talking about Z scores. You know, is Michael Jordan an outlier because he's more than two standard deviations above the mean? And then once we've determined whether or not he's an outlier, what should we do with that? You know, should we delete his score? Like, was he unusual because it was a mistake or should we leave his height in the data set because that does happen uh, that that's kind of an ethical thing uh, a lot of times you don't know if you're doing some sort of experiment if a value is strange because it it happens sometimes or it's strange because maybe you made a mistake maybe you wrote the number down wrong uh, if that's the case, then you might consider deleting it or at least investigating it. In this course, we don't have a lot of time to discuss this because it's very specific to the situation. You know, if you're doing a, a drug trial and, you know, one person dies, do you just delete that outcome so that you can rush your product to market? Uh, you know, th so there are you know, in that situation, it's dangerous to delete one of your values, but in some other cases, it may not be. So we want an objective way of determining outliers. We have one with the Z scores, but even it was kind of just a general guideline. Another one is to use our quartiles to help us determine whether something is unusual or not. And we'll create these things called fences. We'll have inner fences and we'll have outer fences. 
and we'll use those as an objective criteria for determining whether or not a value is an outlier. The inner fences, here's a, I, I drew some, you, we saw these in the Excel version. Uh, we have inner fences, which mean that any value between the inner fences are typical values. And then if you get bigger than the inner fences, but not as far as the outer fence, like in this range here, then you're just possibly a mild outlier. In this case, I'm, I'm pointing at the upper outliers. Or if you're between the lower inner fence and the lower outer fence, eh, you know, possible mild lower outlier. Maybe you don't have to do anything with those. Once you start to hit the extreme values, the outer fences, if you have any data that's above the upper outer fence or below the lower outer fence, those are likely to be extreme outliers and we should investigate those. To determine where these fences go, we have a formula up above. Uh, the formula for the inner fences is given and the formula for the outer fences is given. It's sort of based on it's similar results to what you get when you use Z scores, actually. I didn't pause here to mention what this IQR thing is in the formula. That's an abbreviation for interquartile range. It's a formula, Q3 minus Q1. Third quartile minus the first quartile. It actually, you can actually see it on the plot it's the width of the box. Remember, Q1 is this position, and Q3 is the other edge of the box. So if we look at this width, we use this width as a measure of variation. So it's kind of like, you know, we have standard deviation, we have range, now we have interquartile range as another measure of how spread out our data is. And we incorporate that into these formulas for fences. The 1.5 and the 3 in the formula are just set numbers. Just like we use uh, the number 2 and the number 3 when we're talking about z-scores. You know, 2 is a mild or, you know, typical value if you have a bell curve, and 3 is what we use when we don't have a bell curve. Well, for box and whisker plots, we don't want to have to think about whether it's a bell curve or not. So we've kind of compromised and used these values. But they're always that. And these things are on your formula sheet. I calculated them for supplier B. We calculated Q1 for supplier B. It was 34 defects per 50 boards. And we calculated Q3, which was 49.5 determine the interquartile range, we just look at their difference. So subtract them. The interquartile range is 15.5 defects per 50 boards. Then I just went ahead and I did the calculation of all of the fences. I did the lower inner, the upper inner, and basically if any of these end up outside of your data, you know, you could probably quit there. Uh, like, look at our outer values. We end up with a negative value, which is impossible. You can't have a negative uh, number of defects. So if you had a negative score here, you might, you know, be done at that point. You wouldn't bother to calculate the outer. Uh, I didn't plot those on this curve here, or on our, our box and whisker plot. So maybe we should add them. So... I want to add the inner fences here of 10.75. Oh, I didn't leave enough space on my scale. Here's 10. So my inner fence, my lower inner fence might be, say, there. And my upper one, it fits. Oh, it just fits. It goes something like that. These are our inners. And then we have outer fences way up at 96. 
So, yeah, I don't know. Kind of a weird scale. So our, our outer fence would be up here somewhere. And 96. And our lower one is off my screen <laughs> at negative 12. We can look at these things and we'll see that our entire plot is in between the inner fences. So I don't really have any reason to suspect outliers. That number 72 is pretty close, but it didn't actually cross the line. Question is now, does supplier A have outliers? It kind of looks like it, right? That 79 is bigger than the inner fence. But be careful, the fences that we've drawn on here only apply to supplier B. We would have different fences if we were evaluating supplier A. And those fences would be further away because its interquartile range is quite a bit wider. So I actually, I don't think 79 even is an outlier. If you wanted to see this, you know, prettier, I guess we could go back to our our box and whisker plot. Remember, I, I grabbed supplier B. I'll recopy those values and then I'll move them over to my general box and whisker plot and I'll just paste them in here. See, it's kind of messed up. Uh, the reason for that is, well, I have to go and delete the extras. And the other thing that we did was I manually adjusted this axis. So if I go back to format the axis, I can reset them to auto and then it will plot it. That doesn't quite look right though, does it? I must not have deleted what value. Oh yeah, there's still a couple of <laughs> non-supplier Bs. So there's how it looks. You, you saw my rough sketch. Uh, it, this is a little bit prettier. Uh, you'll see that there is a little bit of a difference. It, in this case, it shows that there is an outlier. The reason for that is that Excel calculates its quartiles a little bit differently than we do. And there, you know, how it was a real close call on the last value there of 72. Uh, if we use Excel to create the box and whisker plot, we might call that last value a mild, a possible mild upper outlier. So that was good that we uh, maybe did this to see that, there, you know, there are, you know, little subtle differences due to how you might calculate your quartiles. And on here, you can see that I calculated the fences here and the numbers are a little bit different than what we had. But again, it, it's because our quartiles aren't the same. It's, but I think it's Q3 that's the difference. So don't sweat it. If I ever ask you to, you know, do a quiz or a test or something, I'll accept answers whether you would used Excel or did it by hand. I think that's a, a good place to call it. We did a lot today. Measures of position and box and whisker plots. Talked about the topic of outliers. So I think we'll we'll cut it off there and start the the last little bit of unit one next time. So everyone take care and I'll see you then.